Tolkien's World, a Marxist Analysis. Section. Tolkien's Appeal. We can now return to the question posed at the beginning of this essay. Namely, explaining how work based on such a conservative outlook has enjoyed such immense popularity. The question is the more interesting because it does not seem to be popularity on a right-wing or conservative basis in the way that the Bond novels and films appeal mainly to the macho male. Or Agatha Christie murder mysteries appeal to middle-class nostalgia for the English village and mansion of yesteryear. Rather, a major part of Tolkien's appeal, and what turned him into an international bestseller, was to the, quote, hippie counterculture in America in the 60s. One obvious and tempting answer is simply to say that the, quote, average or typical reader is not interested in the kind of social and political issues discussed here, but is simply swept along by the good writing and dramatic storyline. In a sense, this is obviously true, and good writing and gripping action are doubtless necessary conditions of the work's success. But in themselves, they are not a sufficient explanation. The affection in which The Lord of the Rings is held by so many involves not just being gripped by the storyline, but being, quote, enchanted, or, quote, inspired by its vision and its values. And that vision and those values cannot be separated from the social relations in which they are embedded, even if the, quote, average reader is not aware of this in these terms. So how does a vision of a feudal society imbued with deeply conservative values, which in the real world, in a modern bourgeois democratic society, would have practically zero political support, manage to exercise such an attraction? First, because what we are presented with is a totally idealized feudal society. The most obvious and fundamental feature of feudalism and medieval society, namely its poverty, and hence the poverty of most of its people, is simply airbrushed out. Even in contemporary America or Europe, there is large-scale poverty. Never mind Latin America, South Asia, or Africa, or Europe in the Middle Ages. But not in Middle Earth. Neither in the Shire, nor Rohan, nor Gondor, nor anywhere else do we encounter ordinary, run-of-the-mill poverty. From time to time we encounter, quote, lowly or, quote, humble people, such as Sam Gamgee and his gaffer, or Baragond in Minas Tirith, but never anyone actually suffering privation. Nor do we find any of the concomitants of poverty, such as squalor or disease, or even grinding hard work. The real Middle Ages had the Black Death and numerous other plagues and famines. I offer a couple of paragraphs from Wikipedia on famine in the Middle Ages. It matters not whether the details are correct or not, for the general picture is abundantly clear. Famine in the medieval European context meant that people died of starvation on a massive scale. As brutal as they were, famines were familiar occurrences in medieval Europe. As an example, localized famines occurred in France during the 14th century in 1304, 5, 10, 15 to 17, the Great Famine, 30 to 34, 49 to 51, 58 to 60, 71, 74 to 75, and 1390. In England, the most prosperous kingdom affected by the Great Famine, years of famine included 15 to 17, 21, 51, and 69. For most people, there was often not enough to eat, and life expectancy was relatively so short, since many children died. According to records of the British royal family, the best off in society the average life expectancy in 1276 
was 35.28 years. Between 1301 and 25, during the Great Famine, it was 29.84 years. While between 1348 and 75, during the Black Death and subsequent plagues, it went to 17.33 years. The height of the famine was reached in 1317 as the wet weather hung on. Finally, in the summer, the weather returned to its normal patterns. By now, however, people were so weakened by diseases such as pneumonia, bronchitis, tuberculosis, and other sicknesses, and so much of the seed stock had been eaten, that it was not until 1325 that the food supply returned to relatively normal conditions and the population began to rise again. Historians debate the toll, but it is estimated that 10 to 25 percent of the population of many cities and towns died. While the Black Death, 1338 to 75, would kill more. For many, the Great Famine was worse. While the plague swept through an area in a matter of months, the Great Famine lingered for years, drawing out the suffering of those who would slowly starve to death and face cannibalism, child murder, and rampant crime. Footnote. Once again, I have thought it reasonable and convenient to cite Wikipedia because nothing turns on the accuracy of the specific figures. It is simply an easy way of pointing up well-known general conditions. End of footnote and end of quoted Wikipedia section. Nothing like this ever happens in Middle-earth, not in the 10,000 years of its three ages. Average life expectancy in medieval Europe was about 30. It was so low because of the high infant mortality. Infant mortality was ever the scourge of the poor, and it remained high until well into the 20th century. The infant mortality rate was well over 100 per 1,000 births in Victorian Britain, and 150 per 1,000 worldwide in 1950. Today, it is 6.3 per thousand in the USA, 2.75 in Sweden, but 180 in Angola, and 154 in Sierra Leone. No such problem exists in Tolkien's world. Nor is there cholera, or tuberculosis, or cancer, or heart attacks. Crucially also, there is no exploitation or systematic oppression or slavery, except were carried out by Morgoth, Sauron, or his agents and allies. The extreme moral bipolarity of Middle-earth, which I think is an important aesthetic weakness, is very useful here. Middle-earth is not a boringly happy utopia. On the contrary, it is filled with danger and evil without Tolkien ever having to deal with any issues of social justice, because all injustice and oppression is simply laid at the door of the enemy. Another factor in the appeal of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings is that the entry point into this feudal world and our immediate point of identification throughout the saga is via The Hobbits, Bilbo and Frodo in particular, and The Shire, and not as it is in the much less popular Silmarillion, via the One, the Ainur, and the Eldar. The Shire, especially the Shire as it is first presented at the start of The Hobbit, exists within a feudal context. Wizard and dwarves turn up at the door, but it is not itself feudal. Here is the description of Bag End on page one of The Hobbit. Quote, it had a perfectly round door like a porthole, painted green, with a shiny yellow brass doorknob in the exact middle. The door opened onto a tube-shaped hall like a tunnel, a very comfortable tunnel without smoke, with paneled walls and floors tiled and carpeted, provided with polished chairs, and lots and lots of pegs for hats and coats. No going upstairs for the hobbit. Bedrooms, bathrooms, cellars, pantries, lots of these, wardrobes, he had whole rooms devoted to clothes, kitchens, dining rooms, 
were all on the same floor. This hobbit was a very well-to-do hobbit, and his name was Baggins. End quote. This is not medieval or feudal. It is England. Very definitely England. The name Bag End comes from the farmhouse in the tiny Worcestershire village of Dormston, in which Tolkien's aunt lived. Somewhere between the early modern period of the Tudors, in terms of its technology and being pre-Cromwell, and the Cotswolds of Cider with Rosie, or even later, in terms of its coziness. It is worth noting that although the Shire has a thane, an Anglo-Saxon term, an office held by the chief member of the Took family, quote, the thaneship had ceased to be more than a nominal dignity, and, quote, the only real official in the Shire at this date was the mayor of Michel Delving, or the Shire, who was elected every seven years. End quote. I think this is the only example of such a modern and democratic notion as election in the saga. And significantly, it is Sam who becomes mayor when he returns from the war. Tolkien confirms this geographical slash historical location and his nostalgia for it in the foreword to the second edition. Quote, it has been supposed by some that, quote, the scouring of the Shire reflects the situation in England at the time when I was finishing my tale. It does not. It indeed has some basis in experience, though slender. The country in which I lived in childhood was being shabbily destroyed before I was ten. In days when motor cars were rare objects, I had never seen one. And men were still building suburban railways. End quote from the Fellowship of the Ring. The Shire, of course, is just as much an idealized image of rural England in the late 19th century, or any other time, as Middle Earth is of the Middle Ages. No enclosures, no hanging poachers, no poor laws, no toll puddle martyrs, and so on. But there is a further point, and it is the most important. This idealized view of the pre-capitalist or early capitalist past can form the basis for a critique of modern industrial capitalism. Marx refers to this in the not very well-known section of the Communist Manifesto on, quote, feudal socialism. Beginning of quote. Owing to their historical position, it became the vocation of the aristocracies of France and England to write pamphlets against modern bourgeois society. In order to arouse sympathy, the aristocracy was obliged to lose sight, apparently, of its own interests, and to formulate their indictment against the bourgeoisie in the interest of the exploited working class alone. Thus, the aristocracy took their revenge by singing lampoons on their new masters, and whispering in his ears sinister prophecies of coming catastrophe. In this way arose feudal socialism, half lamentation, half lampoon, half an echo of the past, half menace of the future. At times, by its bitter, witty, and incisive criticism, striking the bourgeoisie to the very heart's core, but always ludicrous in its effect, through total incapacity to comprehend the march of modern history. End quote. Tolkien is not a, quote, feudal socialist, but he does favorably contrast the pre-industrial past with the industrial present. Earlier in the manifesto, Marx writes, quote, The bourgeoisie, wherever it has got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his, quote, natural superiors, 
and has left remaining no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest, than, quote, callous cash payment. It has drowned the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of Philistine sentimentalism, in the icy water of egotistical calculation. End quote. Tolkien runs this film backwards. From the world of egotistical calculation and callous cash payment, he harks back to the, quote, feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors and, quote, feudal patriarchal idyllic relations. This is the real key to Tolkien's mass appeal, including his appeal to hate Ashbury hippies. Because if one abstracts from the poverty, famine, disease, exploitation, oppression, etc., then the Middle Ages can be held up as a purer, nobler time than the dirty modern world of factories, pollution, profit, money-grubbing, vulgar commercial interest, shoddy goods, advertising, and extreme alienation. And in some respects, it was. In real life, in actual politics, this abstraction is completely impossible, of course. And what one ends with is either tragedy, Pol Pot, or farce. Colonel Blimp, New Age Druids, or some mixture of the two. Mussolini, perhaps. But in fantasy, indeed in literature and art, it is perfectly possible. Nor does this just apply to Tolkien. It is why a romantic, anti-capitalist, feudalizing tendency, leaning sometimes to the left and sometimes to the right, has been a substantial cultural force ever since the Industrial Revolution. Elements of it are present in William Blake, quote, England's green and pleasant land versus the dark satanic mills, and the romantic poets generally. It is explicit in the pre-Raphaelites, and mixed with socialism and Marxism in William Morris, who is a significant influence on Tolkien. In Ireland, we find it in Yeats' Invocation of the Celtic Twilight. It is a significant component underlying the brilliant critique, and the disgust tinged with anti-Semitism, of T.S. Eliot's most powerful poetry, the Wasteland, Gerontian, the Hollow Men, etc., and probably receives its most extreme expression in the poetry, literary criticism, and politics of Ezra Pound, which combined affection for Anglo-Saxon, ancient Chinese, and troubadour poetry with right-wing social credit economics against usury and the bankers, and ended up broadcasting for Mussolini in the Second World War. It is this, I believe, which explains why Eliot and Pound could write major poetry while being, respectively, an Anglo-Catholic royalist who thought the rot set in with the murder of Thomas a Becket and a real fascist, and why a conservative Catholic professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford could write books that have sold in the tens of millions. End of section.